Hi everybody, um, my name is Aria Rao and I'm the director of the Science Squad Corporation and today we have Dr. Joe Cole from Ferris State University lecturing about optometry today, so I'm just going to hand that off to him. Okay. Uh, hello everybody. As Aria mentioned, my name is Joe Pohl. I am a uh, I'm an assistant professor at the Michigan College of Optometry, um, and I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about some contact lens optics. Um, so just to start with, I wanted to uh, provide everybody with a little bit of contextual information, and that's just some background on how lenses work and then how corrective lenses work. Um, so lenses, historically, they've been around for thousands of years, really. Um, they were originally just used um, to basically just take the light and channel energy, concentrate it um, so that fires could be built, kind of like how you take a magnifying glass and then burn ants on a sidewalk or something. Um, then around the Middle Ages, somebody realized that, oh, you can actually see through these things and they have magnification effects. So in the Middle East, a lot of the imaging properties um, of lenses were described during the Middle Ages. Uh, by the end of the 18th century, lenses were being mounted as glasses, spectacles for vision correction. Um, in all of those cases, what's being done is the lens is changing the direction of the light that passes through it. Um, so if you, have a, uh, if you have a light that enters a lens and all the rays are parallel to each other, the rays that leave are going to change direction and focus at a location. And that change in direction is called refraction. The amount of refraction that a lens has varies. It depends on its shape, um, but it's quantified by a figure of merit called dioptric power. Um, a lens with a low amount of power, like what we see on the left-hand side of this slide, um, it forms an image point, so where all those exiting rays converge at a spot far away from the lens. A higher-powered lens, like what we see on the right, forms that image a lot closer. Lens power in general isn't computed by where the image forms. It's actually computed based on the design of the lens. So if you know what type of transparent material that the lens is made of, which is usually characterized by what's called its index of refraction, and you know the curvature of the front surface, which is characterized by the radius of a sphere that that curve would make, and you know the curvature of the back surface, which is also characterized by a radius, that's enough information to compute the amount of power that that lens has. It's going to take some formulas to do that, and I've put the formulas up at the top of this slide here. If you want to compute the power of a front surface, you take the index, subtract 1, and then you divide by that rate front radius of curvature. If you want to know the power of the back surface, you actually reverse the subtraction. You take 1 minus n instead, and then you divide by the back radius of curvature. The reversal is due to the fact that you're going from the front to the back. Once you get those surface powers, you add them together, and then that gives you the total power of the lens. One last thing about power, every physical quantity out there um, is going to have to have a unit attached to it. For example, time has units of seconds or minutes. Length has units of centimeters or inches or miles. Lens power has units of diopters, and that's given denoted by a capital D. So let's just do an example with this computation. Let's say that we've got a lens that looks like this. We've got a front surface here. It's got a radius of curvature of 20 centimeters. We've got a back surface over here. It's got a radius of curvature of 10 centimeters. And this lens is just made out of glass. And glass has an index of about 1.5. Usually index of refraction is a number, well, it's always a number higher than 1. It's usually never greater than 2, although there are exceptions to that. So first off, to make this formula work, we have to convert the radius to meters. So for the front surface, that was 20 centimeters. I have to divide by 100 and make it 0.2 meters. The top's going to be 1.5 minus 1, or 0.5. That divided by 0.2 gives you 2.5 diopters. That's the front surface power. Similarly, if we want to compute the back surface power, we take 1 minus 1.5, 1 
We divide by 10 centimeters, but we convert it to meters, so 0.1 meters. If you work out that math, and I encourage you to do that on your own, if you got a calculator handy, then you'll get a power of minus five diopters. So now we know the front, we know the back, two and a half and minus five respectively. If we add them together, we get a total power of minus two and a half diopters. So note that this quantity, this power here, this total power is a negative number here. It can be actually positive or negative. So let me just briefly explain the difference between a lens with plus power and a lens with minus power. If you've got a lens with plus power, the rays that leave that lens are gonna move closer together. And if you have a lens with minus power, the rays that leave the lens are gonna move farther apart. You can tell whether a lens is plus or minus by its shape. Plus lenses are gonna be thick in the middle and then they're gonna be thin on the edges. Minus lenses are thin in the middle and they're thick on the edges. Now, let's talk about actually correcting the vision of an eye. If you can see clearly and you don't need glasses or contact lenses or anything, then what's happening is um, all the pieces in your eye that focus light, and that would be the cornea, and then you've got what's called the crystalline lens. Those two um, components, they put a clear image on your retina. So where they make an image, where they actually change the direction of the light, when that light forms an image, that meets up with the location of the retina. However, the retina does not have to meet, match where the focusing components of the eye put an image. And so if you take a look here, the, the eye wants to put an image behind the location of a retina. And when that happens, you wind up getting a blur circle or blurry vision on the eye. So the, your vision won't be clear if the light focuses retina somewhere or focuses light somewhere besides the retina. So if you don't have clear vision, what can you do about it? Well, you put what's called a spectacle lens in front of your eye. So we know that a lens will change the direction of light. So we want to just change the direction of the light in just the right way that then when the light then leaves the focusing components of the eye, you wind up with an image on the retina and you get clear vision. That's the job of a spectacle lens, to just manipulate the light in such a way that you get an image forming in the same location as the retina of the eye. Now, plus lenses and minus lenses can be used to correct vision. Um, if a plus lens is used, then um, that's going to correct the vision of somebody that can see distant objects clearly, but not close up. And that condition is called farsightedness, or optometrists like to use a fancy word called hyperopia to describe that. And if it's a minus lens that's doing the correcting, that means that the person that needs that lens can see up close, but they can't see far away. And in that case, the person is nearsighted, or the fancy word to describe that would be myopia. So that's how a spectacle lens works. And spectacle lens is great, but they have to be mounted on the nose in front of the eye. You can also place a lens directly in contact with the eye, and that's called a contact lens. So that's put right at the front of the eye or the cornea. Now, in general, contact lenses, they behave just like spectacle lenses, except those surfaces are more highly curved. So that's really the only difference between a contact lens and a normal spectacle lens, the curvature of the surfaces. So why does a contact lens have to have a high amount of curvature? It's because usually what optometrists do is that they put a contact lens on so that the back surface of the lens is about the same shape as the surface of the cornea. That way the contact lens can rest comfortably on the surface of the eye. So that's why contact lenses have to be so much more curved compared to spectacle lenses. So when this happens, when the back surface of the contact matches the cornea surface, then the amount of refractive power that they need, the amount of dioptric power that that person needs to correct their vision, that will be the same as the amount of power that's in the contact lens, the total contact lens power. You might be thinking, well, yeah, that makes sense. Of course, they're going to be the same. That's how vision gets corrected. However, 
you don't actually have to fit a contact lens whose back surface, which is what my cursor is tracing out here, matches the surface of the cornea. They can be a little different, not a lot, but a little different. When that happens, the space in between the contact lens and the cornea actually fills in with the person who's wearing the contact lens as tears. Okay? So it's not air between the contact lens and the eye, it's actually the tears. Now what's interesting about this is that the tear layer also acts like a lens. So if you're going to put a contact lens on whose back surface doesn't match the cornea, you get that tear-filled gap, then you also have to take the power of the tears into account when you're trying to figure out what contact lens to give to the patient. So you take the amount of power they need, and then you subtract off the power of the resulting tear layer. That gives you the contact lens that the patient's going to need. And in general, under these conditions, it'll be different than their, their RX. All right, so how do you figure out what that tear power is going to be? Well, you treat that tear layer just the way that we treated the lens from earlier in this lecture. So the tear layer's got a back surface, it's got a front surface. The back surface, that depends on the radius of the cornea, because the back of the tear layer is going to be the same as the shape of the cornea. And then, so we divide by that, we end up with this fraction with that on the bottom, and then this number minus 337 and a half on top. That's the formula for computing the power of the back. To get the front, we take plus 337 and a half, and we divide by the radius of the back surface of the contact lens. So those are the two formulas for computing the back and the front, respectively. Now, they're pretty similar. They both have radii on the bottom, so we're taking the shape of the tear layer into account. You might be wondering where this 337 and a half comes from. Well, that comes from the index of water, which is a, mostly what tears are composed of. And it also comes from the fact that we're going to just keep the radius in millimeters, okay? Because that's how it's usually measured for a contact lens. So the fact that the radii are in millimeters here, that's why we have such a big number on top in these formulas. So to compute the power of the tiers, what do we do? We add those two guys together. We take the back. We take the front. We add them together, that gives us the power of the tiers, and then I'm just going to insert that into this thing right here. Now we get a new formula for computing the contact lens power based on what the patient needs, the, um, the, the radius of the contact lens, and the radius of the patient's cornea. And those are all things that the radius of the cornea is something the optometrist can measure directly. The power that they need is something that they can figure out. And then the radius of the contact lens, that'll be on the box and the contact lens that gets dispensed to them, to the patient. So just a quick example there. Let's say that a patient normally uses a plus 5D lens to correct their vision. That would be the amount of spectacle power they need. That's how much the optometrist figured out that they need to get a clear image on their retina. Um, they have a cornea with a radius of 7.8 millimeters. That's pretty standard corneal radius right there. And they're fit with a contact lens whose back radius is 7.5 millimeters. What should the power of this contact lens be so that they get clear vision? And just as a hint here, it won't actually be plus 5D because these two radii are not the same. So what's it going to be? Well, we put the, the two radii into the formula. Okay, so the contact lens radius goes here, the radius of the cornea goes right here, and when you actually plug the numbers into this formula, we wind up getting a contact lens power of plus 3.25 diopters. So even though they normally need a plus 5D lens to correct their vision, the tear layer is actually providing some power of its own, and that's changing the power of the contact lens that this patient needs. Okay. So, on that, that's going to uh, finish my talk here. So, uh, 
Uh, there we go. Stop sharing. Okay. Uh, Aria, are we still on? Yeah, we're still on. Okay, great. Um, so that's going to do it for my talk. Um, what happens here? Uh, do I take questions or is that it? Um, I think we'll take a minute for questions. Okay, great. So I will just pull up that link, and if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box. I'll wait maybe, you know, 15, 20 seconds, but if not, then um, thank you for watching. Yeah, so it looks like no one's typing anything. Thank you so much to Dr. Pohl for coming out, and thank you to all of our viewers for coming out and watching the lecture series. Um, we won't have a lecture next week because uh, Big Rapids Public Schools is on spring break, but the week after, we hope to see you back. Um, so have a good night. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Aria. Bye. <laughs>